say we started part two. And that's considering the story of the revelation at Sinai, whether we have adequate reason to believe the story is true. First point I made yesterday was we have to agree on what counts as adequate reason. In particular, we have to agree that adequate reason does not require proof. Proof is much too strong a requirement. It's too strong because we have proof for virtually nothing. If we required proof, we'd have to say we don't have adequate reason to believe anything. That would make assessing our reasons and criticizing our reasons and trying to prove our reasons just a, a mistake. It would be worthless because we would never have adequate reason for anything. And that's not a, an appropriate position, yeah. Is there any example that you could give that um, show 100% proof? Would you say maybe like mathematics and things like that, that would be 100%? So I'm inclined to think no. I, I'm not sure this is very important for the points that we're d dealing with because we're not dealing with mathematics. But my field of philosophy of mathematics, and I can report to you that there are disagreements about what axioms are appropriate axioms, the disagreements about what kind of logic you should use, the disagreement about various logical rules, whether they're appropriate or inappropriate. Uh, there are different schools. There's the intuitionist and the finitist and constructivist um, uh, schools of mathematics. And they all have their own favorite axioms and proofs that they like, and axioms and proofs that they don't like. And even if something were universally accepted today, how would I have a guarantee that tomorrow wouldn't become controversial? Uh, Descartes offered, I think, therefore I am, as something that's absolutely solid, absolute proof. But even in his own time, there were people who didn't accept it. And they had interesting reasons to, uh, to, to, to disagree. So um, I don't think that we have anything that we can simply sign on and say, this is never going to change. Um, there was a fellow, an expert in quantum mechanics, I think his name was Finkelstein, who challenged what's called sentential logic, the most simple laws of logic on the basis of quantum mechanics. And he said, given the way quantum mechanics works, we have to change those logical laws. Now, whether he's right or wrong, but if you can bring such a challenge, be taken seriously, that means you can't sign on the dotted line and say that these things are absolute. But even if you could, we're talking about historical matters. We're talking about events that took place. On that, for sure, there are no proofs. And still, no one says that, therefore, it's all play and there's no responsibility and whatever you say is OK. I gave an example of knowing who your parents are. Um, you certainly have adequate reason to say that you know or believe, to accept, to commit yourself to who your parents are even though, of course, you don't have a proof. So rejecting proof is something which is almost completely agreed upon in contemporary philosophy. The name of the game for the last 300 years has been to find something weaker than proof that everybody could agree on counts as adequate reason or knowledge. They haven't achieved that. There are lots of disagreements. But the one thing they do agree on is the negative. We're not going to demand proof. And it's a very good thing that we're not going to demand proof because in any context in which you do demand proof, if A gives you his reason and you're looking for a proof and you think he ought to give you a proof, all you have to do to defeat him is you exercise your imagination. If I can think up any possibility that he's wrong, that he hasn't closed off, then he hasn't got a proof. Um, mere possibilities, it seems to me, and I, I, this is as, as universal as you can get in philosophy, Mere possibility is not enough to undermine your adequate reason for believing. What should undermine your adequate reason for believing is counter evidence. You believe something, you believe it for certain reasons. You've got certain evidence that it's correct. If somebody says, but what about this evidence that's against you? This evidence indicates that you're making a mistake. Then you have to take that seriously. Then you have to say, OK, I have my evidence in favor. You're offering evidence against. Let's weigh them up and see which evidence is stronger, that would be a reasonable thing to do. But if I present my position and I say, here's my evidence in favor, and somebody says, but isn't it still possible you're wrong? 
maybe so-and-so. How do you rule out so-and-so? The correct response is, you're right. Maybe I'm wrong. You're right. It's possible that I'm wrong. You're right. I can't rule out so-and-so, but so what? I have positive evidence on my side, and you're not offering any positive evidence that I'm wrong. Just pointing out that I might be wrong. I give that to you. I might be wrong. But since I have evidence, and we'll have to talk about how much evidence, how much evidence is needed, if I have enough evidence, then I have every right to believe it, to accept it, to act on it. I have adequate reason to accept it, even though I might still be wrong. That's the position that I'm working with, defending. And if there's, you know, at any time, we want to discuss this, this is very important to be straight on. It, 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 this comes up, as I said yesterday, in discussions of absolute morality. Couldn't it also be? Sure, it could be, but I have every reason to think that it's this, not something else. Um, it, it, it comes up in the existence of God. It comes up in politics. It comes up, uh, comes up in evolution. It comes up over and over and over again, where the critic demands a proof, and then, of course, he defeats you because whatever reasons you give, he just exercises imagination, says maybe it's E.T. That's not an appropriate debate, seems to me. Okay? That's the, that's the thing. Then I said, in presenting the reasons to believe that uh, Sinai is a real historical event, there are two steps. First step is just an intuition. It's meant to introduce a certain idea it's not a proof, it's not evidence, it's not reason. It's just an intuition to set the boundaries of what we're talking about. And I, explained, I wanted to explain that intuition, and then I said we'll go on to talking about what the real evidence is. I explained that intuition at great length, and at the end I said, since I haven't presented reasons, I've just presented an intuition, the critic will have two responses, and I described them. I'm going to go through that again now briefly. And what we left yesterday was I was presented an intuition, and the critic says I have two ways of defending myself against what you want to want me to admit. And I said, he's right. Given what I have said, the critic up to that point is correct. What I said was, if we imagine someone making up a fake story, making up a story about something that didn't happen, a lie, and trying to get people to believe it, there's going to be a natural resistance for certain kinds of stories. It depends upon the kind of story that he makes up. Some stories that he makes up, there won't be resistance. Other stories he makes up, there will be resistance. Again, I'm describing an intuition now, just an intuition, how people normally think. Where's the dividing line? What kind of stories will there not be resistance? What kind of stories will there be resistance? Well. When he says to the individual, to the family, to the city, to the nation, here's something that happened. Now, he's making it up so it didn't happen. Here's something that happened. And they say, wow, you're telling me that happened? But I, we, have no memory of this. We have no record of this. We've never heard of this. Then it depends. When the people are concerned that they've never heard of it, they have no memory of it, how will they go? It depends upon whether they think, well, let's see what kind of story this is. Is this a story about a kind of thing that people would naturally remember? Or is this a story about the kind of thing which we could expect people to naturally forget? If it's a story about the kind of thing we could expect people to naturally forget, then the fact that we don't remember it is not surprising. It's the sort of thing that people naturally forget. That's what I called yesterday a forgettable. The kind of thing that we expect people to forget. So this guy comes along and says, X, Y, Z happened. I don't remember it, or if it's about my family, my family has no memory of it, or my city, or my nation. No one remembers this. And he says it happened. Shall I believe him, or shall I not? So I said to myself, well, what is he talking about? What kind of thing is he talking about? If it's the kind of thing that I can easily expect people to forget, then I may very well trust him. Why not? If he's... Um, truthful person or reliable person, intelligent person, I may very well trust him. If, however, he tells me a story about something which I very well expect people to remember, it's too big, too important, too cataclysmic to be forgotten, 
then I'm going to be suspicious. I, we, depending upon what story he makes up, we're going to be suspicious and we're going to resist accepting the story that he tells us because it's an unforgettable. So in personal life, I contrasted misdialing your telephone yesterday, your telephone, your cell phone, we call it in Hebrew, so on the cell phone yesterday versus going swimming yesterday. Someone tells you misdialed your, your um, cell phone, you might not remember that. It happens often enough. It's not important enough to remember. Somebody said you went swimming yesterday, you're not going to accept that because you know very well that if you went swimming yesterday, you'd remember that. It's not the sort of thing that you forget. Somebody said that 15 years ago, you were upset with a teacher in first grade for a month and you don't remember it. I think most people would say, well, you know, that could have happened. My parents remember. My uncle and aunts and uncles remember. I don't remember because it's not that important. But they say that I had, I had a broken leg and I was for six weeks and my leg was in a cast and I don't remember it. Then I'm going to resist it. That's not the sort of thing you forget. Even 15 years later, you don't forget that you broke a leg and were in a cast. Same thing's true with, with families or cities. And the same thing's true with nations. You try to tell the British that in 1350, there was a 10-year absence of horses. The whole economy is based on horses. You need horses, transportation, military, uh, communication. Everything's based on horses. For 10 years, there were no horses. It's now 2015. And it's not in any of the history books. I think people would say, look, it must have been a calamity for them at that time. But 100 years later, 200 years later, 300 years later, why should anybody remember it? It's a local calamity. It caused a certain amount of dislocation and got lost in the memories of things more important. But if you tell me that in 1350, Britain conquered all of Europe and occupied all of Europe for 75 years and, and ruled Europe for 75 years, and then over another 25 years, they were gradually beaten back, and there's no record of that. Even the British, who I think are attracted to stories that are down to their credit and to their um, power and control, are not going to accept it because they're going to say, even from 1350, if we had conquered Europe and held it for 75 years, everybody would know that. That's not the sort of thing that nations forget about their history, especially since it makes us into heroes and conquerors and so forth and so on. You're not going to forget that sort of thing. And they're not going to accept it. So there's an intuition. There are some things which we'd expect to be ex forgotten, some things not. Somebody's going to make up a story. If he makes it up about something which people aren't going to forget, then people aren't going to listen to him. Now, the story of the Revelation at Sinai is for sure a paradigm unforgettable. To, to have an experience which you understand is hearing the creator of the universe speak. And with fire and cloud and smoke and the sound of the shofar and the ground trembling under your feet and a, a certain text being received by all the people of the, of the nation simultaneously, including, among other things, a weekly holiday from then on called Shabbos. That is certainly a first-class unforgettable. So if we imagine somebody trying to make that up and sell it to a group of people and saying, listen, all your ancestors 300 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, all of your ancestors stood at the side of a mountain and they heard God speak, you gave them this communication under these conditions. Imagine them making it up and trying to sell selling it to the people. It's a a paradigm unforgettable, and therefore, they're not going to accept it. That's the intuition that I'm dealing with. Have we got it so far? Now, the critic's reaction to this intuition is, this doesn't give me reason to accept that there was a real event at Sinai, for two reasons. First of all, you're just saying people won't accept it. I hear a certain intuition in that direction, but I'm not inclined to agree with you that it's as strong as you think. You think no one ever would accept such a thing? I think that's not true. I think that people 2,500 years ago were much more primitive than we are today. They were much more uh, imaginative. Uh, they weren't as critical as we are today. And uh, therefore, you're probably projecting your own critical nature of 2015 on people 2,500 years ago. And that's not appropriate, I think, if they... The king tells them, or the priests tell them, and they think that the priests have supernatural powers, and so on and so on. I'm not convinced that you're calling it an unforgettable means it will never be accepted. I'm not convinced. That's number one. One point the critic will make. 
The other point of the critical make is, you know, you've set up the, 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 the ball game here in a very funny way. You set it up that you're going to rule out somebody making it up, faking it, and trying to tell it to people, and you say that's unreasonable, and then I'm supposed to conclude that it really happened? There's a gigantic middle ground that you're leaving out. Maybe nobody faked it, just made it up and tried to sell it to people. But maybe you had a story about something that happened, and as the story was told from generation to generation, it gradually was changed, gradually was added to, gradually was elevated, and after 300 years or 400 years, it grew gradually into the story of a revelation, like we have of many myths of other nations in, in, in ancient times, the myths that people accepted, and we can trace them sometimes to historical events, which got exaggerated over time. You've set up a false pair of alternatives, the critic will say. You set it up that either somebody made it up or it really happened. You have not said anything about this middle alternative of its naturally growing to aggrandize your ancestors and to uh, engaging in fantasy and the kinds of things that make stories change over time. Could very well have made an original story change into a story of revelation. That's the way the critic will defend himself against the intuition. And as I said yesterday, I think the critic is right. He's right. Just presenting this intuition doesn't do the job. It doesn't do the job. I'm stressing this because I have received dozens, scores of emails on the basis of this material, which has been on my website and up for 10 years, who make this point over and over again. And what I do is I copy and paste the portion of the essay, which comes close to the end, where I say, the intuition isn't the reason to believe it. The reason to believe it is the evidence. I give the evidence. They don't get that far. They either don't read to the end, or by the time they've read about the intuition, they don't hear the end is different. I have it in three different places, and I copy and paste from all three places, and I send it to them. But that's not what the argument is supposed to do. So I'm starting now the other way around. I'm presenting the intuition and telling you over and over again, that's not the argument. The argument isn't, golly, I can't imagine anybody accepting that. That's not the argument. The argument is much more serious than that. Okay, are we together so far? Okay, so today I'm going to start to present the evidence on which the conclusion is really based. I'm going to present it pure in a certain sense. By the time I finish presenting it, probably the second complaint of the critic will sound like it's still on the table. You've left out the middle ground of stories changing, myth formation. And then I'll go back and show you that the way I presented the evidence, that alternative is knocked out also. I'm not going to do the two, two, uh, two uh, uh, processes at once. First, I'm just going to present how the evidence goes. Starting with deep background. We live in a world. We need information to get around. Without a certain basic fund of information, we can't make it. We won't survive. Now, there are lots of sources of information. Some are more reliable than others. It's very important to learn which are the more reliable and which are the less reliable sources of information. If you don't learn that and you trust sources of information willy-nilly, you're going to bang your nose against reality over and over again. I have some apps on my kosher cell phone which predict the time when buses will come. They're not equally accurate. <laughs> some of them are really off. And that being the case, if I want to save time and I want to go out and wait at the bus stop for an extra half hour, to learn which ones are accurate, which ones aren't accurate. Airline schedules change. If you have an app that's six hours behind, that could cost you. You'll go to the airport and for a flight that's already been canceled or changed. It's a pain in the neck. You need to learn which sources of information are accurate. I mean to say credible. No, nothing's 100% accurate. And people will make mistakes about this. There's no guarantee that you'll always get it right. But you'd better be pretty good at it. Otherwise, you're going to be running your life on a lot of false information. And you're going to bang your nose against reality over and over again. How do we learn which sources of information are more credible and which less credible? The answer is that we keep score. Most sources of information spew out thousands and thousands of pieces of information every hour. <clears throat> and we read them, and we keep score. From time to time, 
they will deliver a piece of information about which I have personal knowledge. Or people whom experience has uh, taught me to trust have personal knowledge. And then you get emails circulated. CNN said this, but actually it was something entirely different. And you keep score. And of course, you keep score by subject. When CNN reports the final scores of sports contests, they're pretty good at that. They very rarely make a mistake. With the report, who attacked who, then it depends whether they're reporting on the Middle East or the reporting on Australia. When they're reporting on the Middle East, they get it wrong all the time. And we know that. And the reports, Arab sources, equ equivalently with Jewish sources, and of course, the rate of accuracy is not the same at all. So you, you learn from experience which sources to trust. Um, It was a, when, when Ariel Sharon was being treated at Hadassah Hospital in Harat Sophie, on CNN they ran an article that Saturday night some ultra-Orthodox Jews stood in the street at the base of the building in which he was being treated. They raised their eyes to his sixth floor hospital room and chanted prayers for his recovery. Okay. What was really going on was they were sanctifying the new moon. That's what they were doing. They were there because their wives gave birth that day, or there's always Saturday night, and you do always do it outside where you can see the moon. And the poor CNN reporter put two and two together and got 16. You know, Sharon is there, and they're standing there, and they're raising their eyes, and he's on the sixth floor. So they must be chanting. He didn't ask them. He didn't ask anybody else. He just drew a conclusion. So I said, okay, that's good to know. That's good to know. That's how, that's how a CNN reporter will report, report things. When Rabin was assassinated, and they brought his body from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, he's buried here, um, as he entered the city, the, the, the street there was, uh, there were some people there, not the hundreds of thousands that were reported, but there were people there. The press was assigned by their editors, get pictures of people crying. Nobody was crying. Nobody was crying. They were frantic. The editor said, get a picture of people crying. They found a kid who had fallen and skinned his knee. He was crying. All the cameras converged on him. They thought that was the picture that went up. Child crying because of the Rabin assassination. And so, okay, so you see that. And you know what's going on. Everybody reported, Abbas, who said three days ago that Israel executed a 13-year-old Palestinian, right? He's alive in hospital. <laughs> Did that make it to the newspapers? And he had already stabbed another uh, a, a Jewish child and put him in critical condition, right? But that's what... Uh, so you get used to that and you think... So certain sources of information are more accurate or less accurate, and they're accurate in these subjects and those subjects, and that's how you learn. You learn from experience what sources are more trustworthy, what sources are more likely to be correct. I hope this is obvious. That's step one. Step two is another obvious move. And if it really is obvious and you're convinced that I'm wasting your time, that's good because then I have two very solid foundations to build the conclusion on. Sometimes the way you make up your mind to accept testimony is not on the basis of reliability of this source. But it's comparing this source to other similar sources. Here's an example. Two people appear in court and they say, Peter is a murderer because we saw him. We are eyewitnesses to a murder that he committed. So the judge says, tell you a story. His witnesses say, we were out at deep sea on a boat with Peter and Paul, just the four of us. Just the four of us. And Peter pushed Paul off the boat and Paul was eaten by the sharks. Sharks are very thorough. They didn't even leave over his belt buckle. He's gone. All of Paul is gone. We saw Peter kill Paul. Physical evidence, none. Videos, none. Just two eyewitness reports. What is the court going to do? Is the court going to say, well, if there's no video and there's no physical evidence, we dismiss you? No. Eyewitness reporting is evidence. But they will make an investigation. What kind of investigation are they going to make? Are they going to say, listen, you guys are testifying to murder. Let's see how accurate your testimony is. 
let's take a survey of the last 15 cases where you testified to murder and see how many you got right. That's probably not practical, right? How many times does one person witness murder and testify in court? You know, a tiny fraction of 1% have it happen to them at all. How many happens to them twice? If, you're, if your way of deciding whether their testimony is accurate is to say, well, let's see how many times in this kind of circumstance they get it right, how many times they get it wrong, then you're, you're, you're finished. You'll never certify anybody because nobody has a history of witnessing 15 murders and giving testimony in court. And then you can test later and say, well, they got 14 out of 15 right, so they have a good record. No, what we do is this. We say, how old are they? This one's 21, this one's 32, or this one's 11, and this one's 13. I think that's going to make a difference. Because we know that 11-year-olds or 13-year-olds often say things that aren't correct. Very often because they make mistakes. Very often witnessing a murder is an emotionally jarring experience. 11-year-old, 13-year-old can have nightmares afterwards and can uh, be influenced by it and not remember correctly. Whereas a 21-year-old, a 32-year-old, they're adults and we don't expect them to be uh, affected in that way. Um, what about their general intelligence? If they're in the normal range of a general intelligence, it's one thing. If they're not in the normal range of a general intelligence, we're going to be more skeptical about what they say. What about their general psychological health? If they have emotional problems, addictions, um, perceptual problems, attention problems, we're going to be more skeptical about what they say than if they are Free of those weaknesses. What about benefit? Are they going to benefit from getting Peter in jail? If they stand to benefit from putting Peter in jail, we're going to be skeptical. Because maybe self-interest, maybe they're just lying, or maybe self-interest is prejudicing what they saw, and they're they fooling themselves. We have tests. Now, what are we testing? We're saying these two people who say they saw a murder... These two people are in a group of other people with respect to age, with respect to intelligence, with respect to psychological health, with respect to interest. Experience teaches us that people who have these qualities are better or worse reporters of what happened. If they have the qualities of a group of people whose qualities are credit, make them credible witnesses, then we're going, to, we're going to accept their, their testimony. If not, not. It's not their direct record in, in murder testimony. It's the record of people who are similar to them. And experience teaches us what similarities to look for and what similarities not. No one's going to ask, are they right-handed or left-handed? Are they blue-eyed or brown-eyed? Do they prefer Mozart or Brahms? No one's going to ask that because our experience teaches us that whether you're right-handed or left-handed, or blue-eyed or brown-eyed, or you prefer Mozart or Brahms, makes no difference in your credibility. People don't divide up that way. It makes no difference in how often people get things right and how often people get things wrong. But age and uh, emotional problems and, uh, and general intelligence and interest, we know from experience, plays a role in whether what the person says turns out later to be true or not to be true. And if they have the characteristics of people in general who are accurate reporters that are going to accept their testimony and put Peter in jail. And if they don't, they lack enough of these characteristics, then we're not going to put Peter in jail because experience has taught us that people like this do or do not have general credibility. Yeah. Beyond the validity of the witnesses, couldn't you also investigate the circumstances around the incident, such as place, um, timing. Um. That's why I chose my example. I chose my example for people on a boat at deep sea. Now, but the people had to get to the boat, which means they had to go to a pier, which means they had to leave homes that existed. Oh, you mean? Oh, but but that's not going to be, uh, be uh, relevant to the question whether there was a murder. They're not stupid enough. I mean, they they really were at sea. The question is, did he kill him or not? Maybe he slipped off and fell. Maybe he didn't murder him. Maybe there was a fight, and in the fight he fell. 
You didn't just push him off? But again, Peter made, might have never made it to the boat. They're just saying that he was there. Okay. I'm, I understand. But that, that's true. But that's, we, I'm, I'm assuming that that's taken care of. So that there's a, a, a question to deal with. If you have evidence against that, then you mean, that means they're just out and out lies. Going beyond that, the question of whether you should trust them that a murder took place or whether some other thing, something else took place. I mean, the only reason I bring up the circumstances is because with Sinai, it's not just the witnesses, it's also the place, the timing, you know, the incidents that occurred beforehand yeah. and afterhand that bring validity to what was said. Well, maybe so, but I'm not going to use that. But, but you're right in general. I just think that you can, fulfill, you can fulfill those conditions and focus on the question of whether you believe him for the, for the murder or don't believe him for the murder. That's what I'm shooting for. Okay. So now, uh, as I said, I, I hope that all of that, what I, what I said about testimony and witnesses and credibility is, is obvious. Now, what I'm going to explain to you, and this is where the real evidence comes from, is that the story of Sinai comes from a source which has enormous credibility. Enormous credibility. So that because the story of Sinai comes from that source, we have enormous evidence that it's true. Now, before I tell you what the source is, I want to make two preliminary remarks, little remarks. One is the source that I'm talking about is not the Jewish tradition. That's not it. Everybody tells me you're assuming the Jewish tradition is true and then you're using it to prove the Jewish tradition and it's circular and so on and so on. I'm not doing that. It's an entirely different source, an international source, worldwide source. Not, it has nothing to do with the Jewish tradition being reliable. That's what I'm trying to show. If I assume that, then I have to hand in my cards as a, as a logician because that's uh, one of the worst mistakes a logician could make. The source that I'm talking about is not the Jewish tradition, number one. Number two... Usually, I mean, this was obvious in what I said before, but I just want to put it on the table. Usually, when you're dealing with a source like CNN or the New York Times or uh, some other source of information, nobody gets everything right. Some things they get right, some they get wrong. So you keep score, and you're looking for a good score. Let's suppose that over the last three years, you've had 27 pieces of information that you could check directly. If they got 25 out of 27 right, that's a good score. That's a good score. And I'm inclined to trust them for things that I can't check. If they got 15 out of 27 right, I'm going to be skeptical. The ones that I can't check, I'm not going to take their word on it because they don't have a good enough score. So when you're trying to form in your mind an estimate, shall I trust this source or shall I not trust this source, what you want is their percentage. How often, you know, what percentage of the time do they get it right? Here we're talking about a particular source and a group of sources, how often do the sources in this group get it right? What I'm going to show you is that the source that delivers this, the story about the, um, the Revelation Sinai, this source belongs in a group, and this group of sources, so far as we can tell, has never made a mistake. Never made a mistake. We can't test them all. But everyone that we can test turns out to be correct, which means as far as we have been able to test, it has a perfect record. That is a gigantic success. It's a gigantic success. And since our source, the source that delivers our story, our, our story which is not the Jewish tradition, something else, as I'll show you, our source is one of those sources which in human experience we have never found to make a mistake, then we will have very, very good reason to trust that this, this story is correct. Okay, what is the source? The source is, now here I have three conditions. This is the only complicated piece that we have to assimilate. It's national traditions about national experiences that would make a difference in the life of the nation. Three conditions. It's a national tradition that means some nation, any nation, as a whole, accepts a tradition. A tradition about its past, its own past. The tradition says that sometime in the past, all of our ancestors had a certain experience. 
and the experience that the tradition says they had is the kind of, tra- kind of experience that you would expect would be remembered. It would create traditions in the, uh, create a religion or ceremonies or commemorations or poetry or uh, legends or it's not the sort of thing that you would expect to be forgotten. I call these NETs, National Experiential Traditions. Notice I said nothing about Judaism. I'm talking about Nigerian traditions and Eskimo traditions and Chinese traditions and Assyrian and Egyptian and Greek and Roman and Native American and Australian Aborigine and I don't care where you go. I've had this up on the net for a decade and people have brought me counterexamples from all over the world. South Sea Islands. Just that when you look at all the counterexamples and test them against my definition, they never fit. But I'm, I'm making a statement about the world. And what I'm saying is this. Nations have traditions. Nations have stories about their history. Lots of stories. Sometimes the stories describe national experiences that would leave an impact on the nation. Very often they don't. Very often the stories about heroes, individuals, small groups that did various things, events that took place that nobody saw. Nations have a wide variety of traditions about their history. I'm only interested in particular subclass. The subclass is where the national tradition describes an experience, not just something that happened, something that people experienced, and the people who experienced it was everybody in the nation, and it's the kind of experience that people we would expect would remember. I'll give you some examples. Let's take war. The strongest case in this, in this category is defeat, being defeated in war. Typically, being defeated in war meant that the victorious army invaded, broke down the walls, and, and despoiled the cities, and raped the women, and uh, looted the treasury, and slaughtered people, and then set up guards, and continued to tax the people. That's what happened. When you were defeated in war, everybody knew it. They knew it firsthand. Or a technological invention. So-and-so invented this, and everybody got one. Bow and arrow. Um, I don't know if you know, but the Greeks invented steam power. They just used it for toys. We actually have a picture of of a a metal um, sphere with a, um, a hole with a spout coming out at an angle, uh, filled, half filled with water, with a fire underneath, and the steam coming out the hole makes it go round and round. Right? They just use it for toys. But we know they had it. Um, migrations, pestilence, where there was a, like the Black Death in Europe, where in 10 years, 30% of Europe died in 10 years. Everybody knew about that. It wasn't the fact that somebody climbed a mountain, came down and said, I saw an albatross on the mountain. Everybody knew it firsthand. We're talking about national traditions, about national experiences, and not every national experience counts because sometimes you can have an experience that the whole nation had, even an experience that would make an impact at the time, but because it had no practical effects, people forgot about it, like eclipses. Very, very few nations made records of eclipses. They happen quite regularly, Every decade or so, there's, there's a, a total solar eclipse. Well, it's frightening when it happens. and certain myths about it, but then you make records when it happened. So you tell somebody, 162 years ago, there was an eclipse. He can't tell you yes or no. Nobody knows. They didn't remember things like that. We're talking now about a national experiential tradition. That's a source of information. Now, this is probably obvious, but I just want to stress it, and then we'll probably look, look quicker today. I'm, I'm talking now about stories. I'm talking about stories. Up to now, these are just stories. I didn't say any of them were true. I just said these are a type of story. And our story about Sinai is this type of story. This is just a classification of stories. For all I've said up until now, they could all be novels. Just made-up stories. Now the question is, 
if we investigate this category, this particular category, national experiential tradition, what do we find? Some can be checked, some can't be checked. That's true with every source of information. Some can be checked, some can't be checked. Of the ones that can be checked, how many turn out to be true? The answer is every one. There's not a single known failure, not one. Not a single known failure. That means in the sum total of human experience, nations that accept traditions about their past, all over the world, we don't know of a single failure. Since all the ones we can check turn out to be true, that gives us very good reason to accept the ones we cannot check. Let's say, I'm going with this assumption for now, let's say we can't check the Revelation of Sinai directly. Okay, so we can't check it. We also can't check whether Peter killed Paul. Paul's gone. Maybe he's hiding in China. Two eyewitnesses say he pushed them off the boat. If they're credible because they're part of a group of people who experience this Taurus as credible, Peter's going to go to jail. Similarly, our story is delivered to us by a national experiential tradition, like the national experiential tradition of Eskimos and Nigerians and Chinese and even people in San Francisco. And we don't have a single case of such a tradition being false. If that's the case, then we have very good reason to accept that this tradition is true, like all the other ones of this class that we have checked turned out to be true. We have very good reason to accept that this is true, and it's, it's uh, evidence in, on the basis of human experience what in philosophy is called empirical evidence. You call it empirical, and it gets a big mark for honor, you know, because it's called empirical. It's got a big name from, from Greek, and therefore it must be very important. It's positive empirical evidence that the story is true. That's the basis of the argument. So tomorrow, I'll repeat the whole thing. Slowly, we'll go through it piece by piece, and then I'll talk about the objections that people have raised, some of which are relevant objections, some of which are not, and we'll try to put the thing together. Mm -hmm.